Welcome to Outrage Overload, a science podcast about outrage and lowering the temperature. This is episode 27. Given their vast apparent differences in content, tone, and ideological alignment, what could late-night comedy shows and far-right talk shows have in common? Well, a lot, it turns out. They can have a similar impact on their viewers. They influence our understanding of political events, set the agenda for certain issues, and frame events in a particular ideological context. There are also shared characteristics between the audiences of late-night comedy shows and far-right talk shows. Both groups are confident in their political beliefs, are passionate about politics, and often have strong social and cultural ideologies. These traits are observed in both left-leaning late-night comedy audiences and right-leaning far-right talk show audiences. Most importantly, late-night comedy shows and far-right talk shows deliver messages that align with their audience worldview and reinforce their beliefs. But we also find differences in these audiences. We don't tend to see late-night comedy-style shows targeted to a right-leaning audience, and nor do we see talk shows with that in-your-face style catering to left-leaning audiences. Why is that? We'll talk about all this and more on this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. I'm your host, David Beckmeyer, and we'll be meeting a communication expert who studies how the media influences our political beliefs. Danigal G. Young is the author of Irony and Outrage, The Polarized Landscape of Rage, Fear, and Laughter in the United States, a book that was foundational to this podcast. And now she has a brand new book. I'm Danigal Goldthwaite Young. I'm a professor of communication and political science at the University of Delaware. And my new book is called Wrong. How Media, Politics, and Identity Drive Our Appetite for Misinformation. Young's work is important because it helps us to understand how we can be more critical consumers of information in today's polarized political climate. She's going to give us some insights into how the media we consume influences our thinking, how we can be more intentional about our online presence, and most importantly, how we could be wrong. Professor Young, I mean, I am like a kid in a, you know, at a concert of the first, you know, got to meet, getting to meet their superstar the, for the first time here. So I, I really know your time is like crazy right now and you're so in demand. So I really appreciate you making the time for, for our little show. That is the nicest thing anyone's ever said to me, that talking to me is like being a kid at a first time concert. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there were several... Um, works that were sort of foundational to this podcast and like there was sort of the jeffrey barry barry sarah sober outrage industry book and it was kind of the political sectarian sectarianism paper and there was some others and and among them was was your your other book the, the prior book the irony and outrage book and i've sort of been trying to get you on the show for a long time here so i mean this is just so great for me that you could be here now and i and i i really enjoyed the new book as well so i, I um we're looking forward to talk about all that Great. Thanks for having me on, David. This is going to be fun. I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> but if we do have a problem. And we sort of talked about it a little bit before we started that, you know, there's like, hey, there's the problem of the Taylor Swifty <laughs> problem. And then there's the and then there's the problem of that. There's like so much stuff in your works and in, in your two books and other, other work as well. That's so relevant to stuff we talk about on this show that, you know, we're, there's no way we can we can cover anywhere near all of it. So I guess the biggest thing about that to the listeners is that whatever amount we do cover, it's a tiny slice of, of this. So you, you want to get these books and, and check them out for sure. And if it's okay with you, before we jump into the new book, I would like to kind of talk a little bit about the prior book, Irony and Outrage, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I really loved the, all the references and sort of stats in that book. And there were a lot of sort of hmm moments for, for me as I, as I was going through it. 
you know, and one takeaway from me, and I always like to get sort of the real expert on to see if I got it wrong, uh, that can sort of straighten us out. But, you know, I sort of took away this thing that in, in hindsight seemed like it should have been obvious, but, you know, was was, was sort of like the, the in a super simplified version of, of sort of the right kind of has the Rush Limbaugh types, you know, and kind of they're in your face, you know, kind of insults and att personal attacks, things like that with and name calling and such. And on the left, the sort of it's not equivalent, maybe in effect or, or in um, in nature, I guess, but it sort of serves a similar purpose as the late night um, comedians. Um, and, you know, that was something that in hindsight seems, yeah, duh, that was like so obvious, but it wasn't as obvious until I read your book. But I guess, you know, is that a reasonable way to think about it? That was very well summarized. Yeah. And, and that's kind of how what, when I started, I started working on um, sort of the content and effects of late night comedy when I first started graduate school, which was in 1999. And I started my graduate program right around the same time that Jon Stewart had taken over The Daily Show. Um, and very quickly, his show became sort of iconic for that moment. And then 9-11 happened. And then his coverage really put the media coverage of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan under the microscope. And, and it definitely felt like something important was happening there. And when I, I started looking at the audiences for uh, The Daily Show and, and the audience for Stephen Colbert, before that, I had looked at the audience of like Dave Letterman and Jay Leno, sort of your network night, uh, late night shows. Um, and when it came to the real satire shows on Comedy Central and the people watching those, we're talking about people who were really well informed about politics and who consumed all kinds of news and who uh, participated a lot and talked about politics a lot. And they felt confident in their ability to participate in politics. And um, and they also were you know, passionate about their political views. Right. So they did tend to skew more to the left. And when I talked to my advisor about this, Joe Capella, he remarked that it was wild just how parallel those characteristics were to the characteristics that he and Kathleen Hall Jameson had found looking um, at the audience of Rush Limbaugh in their book called Echo Chamber. And I thought, it, my first response was one of aversion because I was like, no, this is so, this is not that, this is not what that is. Um, but the more... I got into the literature, the more I had to acknowledge that there's a parallel function and focus going on here where, you know, it, it looks and feels so different from, you know, your opinion shows on the right, but late night satire is doing something similar, right? It's setting their audience's agenda. It's bringing things to the top of their mind. It's framing events and issues a certain way ideologically um it's also being critical of certain media outlets maybe different media outlets than the right shows are critical of um so that then took me into the land of political psychology where i'm you know thank gosh that's where i've been because that has been such a fun home to be in where it's clear that Political ideology, especially social ideology, is correlated with all kinds of different psychological traits and ways of approaching the world. And um, yeah, so that's kind of how I ended up here, basically. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, and one thing that was covered a lot in that book that was a lot of those kind of hmm moments was kind of this uh, these traits Um Kind of, kind of a epistemological traits. I'm not even saying that word right. <laughs> you are. You absolutely are. That was correct. And um, you know, and I've seen, um, and 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 this this is actually talked about in in both books. Actually, you cover this some more in in the in the new book as well. And you know, and I've seen people sort of carry some of this around as a badge, sort of like they kind of pull out, cherry pick some of the things out of these, this, this idea and say, well, see, I told you those other guys are thinking the wrong way. Uh, and I'm pretty sure you're not saying that. So maybe tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> well, David, I'm glad that you know that that's not what I'm saying. Um, so, but so, so the traits that, that are really at the heart of this in irony and outrage, and they actually come back in wrong. Um, these are, 
sort of characteristics, there are batteries of questions that people respond to where they say, you know, you know, how well do the following describe you? And people answer questions like, I like thinking hard for long hours and I like solving complex questions versus um, I'm fine having an answer to a problem. I don't need to know why that answer is what it is or uh, that was that's terribly worded, but uh, that's not exactly what the wording is. But but trying to discern people who really enjoy thinking and, and finding solutions to problems um, versus people who are, would really prefer to have answers or, or, or not think for too long, not think, you know, for uh, about complex things, um, but rather have answers provided and just sort of move on, like function efficiently. Uh, and that's need for cognition. And then there's another trait, which is re reverse correlated with that, which is called need for closure. Um, we can also think of need for closure and its opposite tolerance for ambiguity. And these are very much related to need for cognition, but they're about how comfortable people are with um, unpredictability, uncertainty, and um, really chaos in one's environment. Uh, so people who are tolerant, have tolerance for ambiguity are okay when um, things are uncertain and unpredictable. They're okay with stories that don't have a clear ending. They they don't need to have sort of fixed constructs in their world. Um, it's okay to sort of experiment and not know what things mean and not know how things end. But if you are high in need for closure, low in tolerance for ambiguity, you are quite the opposite. So those are at the heart of a, a lot of what I looked at in to try to account for why it is that the preferred genres of the left and the right look so different because it turns out that cultural conservatives tend to be lower in need for cognition and higher in need for closure. Okay. So now what's essential here is that we really start to think about what those concepts mean, because you're correct that there are folks who might come away from that and say, see, I told you they're thinking wrong or they're not smart. Incorrect, because need for cognition is not about how smart an individual is. It is how motivated they are to think for a long time about something that is complicated. Now, if you are on the left, you probably see that as desirable, right? In part because that is sort of a set of norms that the left sort of, sort of prides itself in having, right? No, we think long for many hours, okay? Same with tolerance for ambiguity. That's something that is, even think about how that is framed. Tolerance for ambiguity. That sounds like not something that is normatively positive, right? That, that you know, you don't want to be intolerant of ambiguity, <laughs> of course. But the, the, the joke that I always make about these traits is that if you think about you know, how they, they're not necessarily always awesome is attend a university faculty meeting where you're in a room full of people who have infinite need for cognition and infinite tolerance for ambiguity. And I'll tell you what is not going to happen. And that is making a hard decision quickly, right? Because there's never enough information. There's always more information there. Well, we don't know for sure if this is going to happen or that's going to happen. Da, da, da. And because we're tolerant of ambiguity, maybe we don't even need an answer today. Let's punt that to next month. Right. But if you are under actual threat, if you're in a situation that requires action and decisiveness, need for cognition and tolerance for ambiguity are not necessarily your friend. Right. Because you're that you might feel stymied because you are not motivated to come to a decision quickly. Um, and, and that's where I feel like being so steeped in one's own ideology on the left can really do a disservice to how you're thinking um, honestly about the role that these traits can play in functional ways on both sides. And the reality is, and that, that sort of how I end irony and outrage, is that both of these orientations to the world are necessary for us to function. Someone's got to be the dreamer and the writer and the researcher and the artist. But someone's got to be the soldier, the rescuer, 
you know, the, the firefighter who can make efficient, consistent decisions under threat. Um, so that's kind of where I take those. Mm hmm. Right. And, and, and uh, yeah, I guess, you know, I think I'll, I'll move on for now for the, to the wrong book, uh, to the other book, <laughs> it's the wrong book. To the wrong book. <laughs> and, um, and because, you know, there, and, but some of the questions may sort of bounce back and forth a little bit because there's, there's, you know, there's, there's so much good info in both, both cases, but I like that in the, the book, um, in the new book, you look at the demand side of wrongness, which, which is something we talk about a lot on, on this show, you know, so kind of like the, you know, we met the enemy and it's ourselves kind of thing. Um, and, and one thing I see a lot um, doing this show is a problem we have with sort of certainty, right? We, we can really latch on to something. And, and then, you know, you, well, you know how that goes. And, and I pulled out something. Uh, so I'm going to quote something from, from the book where you say, being wrong is about who we think we are who we want to be, and who we want to be like. It's about how people like us, people like us, comprehend the world, seek to control it, and find community within it. And, you know, I don't know if everyone was really listening to that, but that's pretty heavy. There's a lot there. And one example you use is that is, is uh, uh, Jenny Cudd, who stormed the Capitol. So, so maybe tell us, you know, can you tell us a little bit about this idea of comprehension, control, and community? Yeah, so I, there is so much research in this space right now, and it's so good, and there are so many people working on both the, the supply side of misinformation, mapping the mis- and disinformation ecosystem, and, and looking at how false claims spread online, and there are also people who are studying why it is we believe mis- and disinformation, who is most susceptible, etc., and uh, my hope in writing this book was to do something that was truly public-facing, that gets through the wonky academic jargon and can translate a lot of that existing work for regular folks who are desperate to, to, you know, cut through this mess. Um, and as I was thinking about and, and looking at the literature on some of the reasons why people believe false information, you know, there, there are reasons that people describe as existential motives epistemological motives, social motives. And at the end of the day, what they're referring to are motives related to our need to control our world and have agency in it, our need to feel like we comprehend our world or understand it, and our need to have community. And I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something super cheesy and use alliteration and take each of these concepts and create a word that starts with a C. And it is going to work because it's super intuitive and it's easy to remember. And I think it's helpful, right? What do we want? We want comprehension. We want control and we want community. Um, so to your question about Jenny Cudd on January 6th, and I don't want to single out Ms. Cudd um, in, in like she was somehow worse than others that day. Um, Ms. Cud was emblematic of a larger phenomenon that day. And the reason that I, I single out her story is because she was broadcasting on Facebook Live from a hotel lobby after she had stormed the Capitol that day. And she was sort of reflecting. I don't know if someone asked her sort of on her live feed or or if she asked herself, like, am I proud of my actions? And I don't know if I can use the F word on this podcast, but she said, yes, I am effing proud of my actions. I stormed the Capitol with effing patriots today. Um, and to me, that statement was so, so telling because what she felt above everything else was that she had been part of a movement what that was that she was part of this group of people who she saw as moral and right and as working towards something good and i thought that i you know i had chills when i saw because she was crying she was throughout the thing you could tell that she was really moved by this moment um and i the big lie was so so dangerous because number one, Donald Trump and conservative media outlets had primed audiences for it for months, you know, saying that if I lose the election, it's because it's been rigged. The only way I can lose is because it's been rigged. Um, that was one. 
And that and that sort of speaks to the comprehension side, right? Where I, I can understand now how we lost. Absolutely. Perfect. So so by offering that up and by saying the only way I could lose is if they cheat, then he lost. Therefore, they cheated. Now I comprehend it. And also talking about um, allegations about how mail-in ballots are more fraudulent, which is false, empirically false. But that also offers his supporters a way to comprehend how did the results end up looking like they did. Oh, it's fraud from the mail-in ballots. The control piece here was really, it, it ended up be, being enacted very clearly. The control piece was come to the Capitol, it'll be wild. So people went to the Capitol and they felt that they had a mechanism of control in the form of disrupting the certification of the electoral vote count. They had a mechanism of control. And it was, you know, Mike Pence decides that, no, this is not how the result of the election looked. They had control in the form of what was the chant? Hang Mike Pence for not doing the bidding. Those were mechanisms of control based on how they comprehended this moment. And the community, I, when I think about the images of that day and I think about, you know, the, the symbolic clothing and the flags and the hats, and, and it was very much an identity-based movement. It was, here we are, we're all part of the same thing together. And in that community was a community of effing patriots, right? So to me, that that moment really just exemplified uh, these three motivations and how they can be enacted in ways that are especially catastrophic. And sort of create that wrongness, right? And we're so yeah. certain about it. They were so, so certain. And I think what was essential as well is that it also helps us understand why you know, I have so many colleagues that are so brilliant working in this area. And I'm sure you're familiar with David Rand and Gordon Pennycook. And, and they had done a study early on looking at belief in the big election lie right after uh, the election. And Folks on the right, it was like 70% of Republicans thought that Trump had actually won. And then they asked which of the following, you know, events or, you know, situations would lead you to change your mind and acknowledge that Joe Biden was the rightful winner. And it was like, um, if all of the Trump's challenges in courts failed, you know, that was one. If Trump himself um, acknowledged that he did not win. If, 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 right. And it's wild to watch that over, you know, weeks following this, this, you know, the election, you had a lot of these things come to pass. You had Trump's attempts to overturn the election fail in many courtrooms. But did that number change? It did not. And as 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 depressing as the results of the the paper were, where it was like, oh my gosh, there are a lot of people who said, even if all these things happened, I wouldn't change my mind. Um, the number that they got was far rosier than the reality, and the reality was, very few people changed their mind, and and that's because, in my estimation, it was not about the empirical truth underlying it. It was about identity driven needs a need to understand the world in a way that is good for my team a need to to control the world in a way that's good for my team and a need to have community and feel connected to my team and if 70 percent of republicans still say trump actually was the rightful winner then that is my answer to that question right yeah. And it's and I think that's, you know, the one of the most sort of it's right in our face sort of issues. But I mean, this occurs in all kinds of ways. Sure. So, you know, um, one thing I was inter really interested in is uh, in the it this came up in 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 wrong. You talk about how we talked about those uh, traits, uh, the epistemic traits. And um, but you talk a little bit about how they're 
maybe, you know, it's a chicken and egg problem, maybe. Like, did the traits occur first, or did I establish my political identity first? And it seems like we're not completely clear on that, right? There, you know, there there is research that suggests that both processes are happening. So in Irony and Outrage, I talk about some compelling work from, even from um, genetics, looking at the physiological systems that map onto how individuals respond to interpersonal threat and how these tend to be sort of heritable, how these systems operate. And because of that, we will tend to find shared, especially again, social and cultural ideology um, among people who share those traits. So social and cultural ideology really is about when we're talking about things related to people, like other people and the extent to which they or their way of life feels like a threat. So things related to uh, immigration, crime, sexuality, um, LGBTQ issues, et cetera. Those are in that so social cultural camp. Um, that being said, as much as I am convinced that there is this sort of biological and genetic foundation for our social and cultural beliefs, when you start to look at some of the longitudinal data and, and you just look at how people behave in the world, it's clear that there are such social and contextual factors that can ignite some of these traits and make it more or less likely that we will perform in accordance with those traits. Um, even if you might have a predilection one way or another, it's not, it's not guaranteed that you will then hold a particular viewpoint. But if you already have that predilection and you are in a community of people who signal to you that that way of understanding the world is the right way, and who perform that regularly, it you know it does seem that those those traits you will become more in line with those traits the more salient your political identity becomes. Yeah, and this sort of speaks to this idea that how we come to know things is got a large social element to it that we kind of think it's all just going to take these facts we're going to look at them and we're going to you know but it's it's got this social element to it. Yeah, I mean, the, the notion of, of social epistemology is a whole area of writing and research. And, you know, when you are an interdisciplinary researcher, one of the problems <laughs> is that you'll think that you've landed on something and you like created it. Right. And then you start digging around and you're like, well, damn, I didn't call it this. But here it is. And there's decades of research on this. Um, and. I'll tell you, the epistemologists have been super friendly and encouraging and supportive, and they exist in a whole other space for me. They're, many of them are, are philosophers who don't deal with uh, survey data or empirical work, but whose understanding of these issues is so sophisticated. Um, I went to an applied epistemology conference at the University of North Carolina two, two weeks ago and just had my mind blown. It was it was fascinating. These are people who think about how we think every day. And I thought that would, I would not be able to leave my house. I don't think I'd be so confused all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I talked to Osa Vick for us. You're probably familiar with her. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah and and the, the sort of knowledge resistance stuff that she's doing. It's fascinating. Um, well, okay, so there's so much we left out, everybody, so just realize that. But I want to sort of jump to some of the maybe ways, you know, some of the suggestions for maybe how we can maybe improve things. Um, and we're probably not even going to cover all those, of course, but maybe we can talk about a, a little bit of it. Um, and, and um, you know, I like this idea that if there are synergistic elements that make the system go, maybe disrupting that could make it stop. Yeah, and my hope is... Um... I'm so wedded to this idea that I'm like, I need to include a flow chart in this book that illustrates for the reader how this operates. And um, 
to my editor's credit, she was like, sure, that sounds great. That sounds awesome. And I said, I want it right in the front. And I want people to be able to turn back to it again and again, because at different points in the book, we're going to talk about different points in this process of how political elites, media elites, journalists, partisan media, social media, all draw upon our social identity to be able to ignite our passions, ignite our emotions, attract our attention and mobilize us. And as they do, they then offer us up all kinds of observations for us to make about the world, but the observations that they're offering up are reinforcing those social identities that they were tapping into in the first place. So um, I don't know if you read Winnie the Pooh as a kid, David, but at the beginning of Winnie, of Winnie the Pooh books, there's a map of the Hundred Acre Wood when you open up the book. And I remember always flipping back to understand like, okay, so now they're at Eeyore's house. Where is that in relation to the river? And it just made me feel like I always knew exactly where we were and in, in relation to other things. So that is how, that is why I put that flow chart in the beginning of the book is so that we can always map Eeyore's house and know exactly where we are. <laughs> um, so because all of these things are interrelated, and I hope the reader comes away with a solid understanding of like how all these things are anticipated and how they're all anticipating what we want. We are the juggernaut in the entire system. It's us. So therefore, if we are the things that they are using to make the system go, we can also be the things that can have a hand in making it stop, as you said. Um so I come up with some solutions at, at the level of uh, social media platforms and journalism, but also at the level of the individual. And at the individual level is what gets me really excited because I feel like regular people are always saying, like, how do we fix this? How do I fix this? Um, and, and the first one, I think, which is so um so close to the heart of what you're trying to do here, right, is this intellectual humility, right? Intellectual humility or openness to the possibility we might be wrong, openness to the possibility that our knowledge is fallible, um, it, and always being cognizant of that and being willing to update one's beliefs. And the, the literature on intellectual humility is compelling, and people who are intellectually humble are significantly less likely to believe misinformation and conspiracy theories. They're less likely to share that kind of content. Um, there's also a lot of pro-social characteristics that we see among people who are intellectually humble. Um, and I, I talk a bit about how we can practice that as individuals, but we could also look to perform it in online spaces. We can perform intellectual humility and we can try to reward elites who perform intellectual humility, like in media and journalism, because right now our media system does, if anything, it punishes those performances. If someone says, this is what I think, but I might be wrong. You're not going to, you're not going to get a slot on MSNBC or CNN or definitely not Fox news, right? They are looking for confident in your face barks and bluster. Um, so if we decide that we want to reward a, a kind of more honest and open approach to understanding, we can reward those performances and demand those performances. Yeah, when we talk about that a lot, but it is a high ideal because we slip back into those primal <laughs> things pretty quickly. Oh, it is so it is so, so difficult. And, you know, even the idea of sort of aggressively mandating that people be intellectually humble seems like a bit of an oxymoron as well, right? Um, so finding ways to thread this needle, it's going to be challenging. But um, but always recognizing that even when you have a sense of sort of moral self-righteousness, reminding yourself, even if it's just from a strategic standpoint or to be persuasive or to, I don't know, make sure that you're not getting high on your own supply, as I like to say. Right. Embracing intellectual humility as like a protective agent to save yourself and your friends, uh, I think it can be worth it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I really, again, folks, I did. We did not cover <laughs> everything in these books, and particularly, we didn't cover all the the potential um, disruptors here either. But, but I really appreciate you coming on the show and and making the time, and and I think that's a great way to end. And I'm definitely trying to do what you're saying, and I, you know, doing my best. Want one guy out here. <laughs> well, I so appreciate it, and if you're trying, and you're always able to be open to the possibility you might be wrong. I think that that's the winning answer. And that's how I end my book. I, after the 280 page thesis, I end by saying, of course, I could be wrong. We could be wrong. Yep. And that's so hard to not see a blind spot to that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. It really is. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate you, you making the time. Thanks so much for having me on, David. This was great. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. That is it for this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. For links to everything we talked about on this episode, go to outrageoverload.net. I want to take a moment to thank those that have contributed to the show. Your support helps us cover costs to continue to improve the show and is greatly appreciated. For as little as $3 a month, you can become a subscriber to get access to exclusive subscriber-only content, sneak peeks into what's coming, behind-the-scenes exclusive content, and you can learn about upcoming guests in advance and even submit questions for the interview. Visit outrageoverload.net slash contribute. Okay, see you in a few weeks. <laughs>